Mr. Dilip Gaur is the Managing Director, Grassam Industries, Head Global Pulp and Fiber Business, Aditya Birla Group and Director, Board of Aditya Birla Management Corporation, Private Limited. Prior to his current role, he was the Deputy Managing Director and Chief Manufacturing Officer of Ultratech Cement Limited. He also headed Hindalco's Global Copper Business. He was the Managing Director of Birla Carbon's Egyptian Business and President and Country Head of Group's Edible Oil and Oleo Chemicals Business in Malaysia and Philippines. Mr. Gaur joined Aditya Birla Group in 2004 after spending 24 years at Hindustan Unilever Limited in Foods, HPC and Speciality Chemicals Business. He was also a member of the Foods Management Committee. He was awarded the Aditya Birla Group Chairman's Outstanding Leader Award in 2011. Mr. Gaur holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and has completed the advanced management program AMP at Harvard University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Dilip Gaur to inspire us by his worthy words. I now request Mr. Dilip Gaur to please take on the center stage and the, this fabulous audience is all yours, sir. Thank you and a very good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, I would like to compliment IMA for an outstanding show they have put up. It, it beats my expectations. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Gupta has already spoken about the $5 trillion economy, so I won't spend much time on $5 trillion, uh, the number. But what I would like to talk to you is about the purpose. I think it's, the numbers not, don't matter. What matters is the purpose. We have done a, there's a study done by, by IMD and a lot of people, there's a company with a purpose outgrow the companies which do not have a purpose. In fact, they withstand the downturn much better. Same applies to the countries as well. So I think let's not get bog bogged down by $5 trillion why and when. What's important is it's a rallying call for Honorable Prime Minister has given and I think we must rise up to it. But what is important is I think this call has come at a time in the inverted comma interesting times. There's a Chinese curse that you should not live in the interesting times. We are living in a VUCA world. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And to achieve this dream in this kind of a world is really a challenge. And I think that's what we have to look at. So we have to look at manufacturing de novo. But before I get on to what we need to do in manufacturing, why are we talking about manufacturing? Because today also about 60% of your uh, economy comes from services. So why do we speak about manufacturing? I think it's important because manufacturing has a multiplier effect. Every one job in manufacturing creates three jobs in the ancillary economy. Go back in the history, no country has become great without going through the manufacturing route. Be it England in 19th century, be it US in Second World War, be it China post 70s, be it, uh, uh, <coughs> be it Japan before that and Korea. So I think you cannot bypass manufacturing if you want to become a great economy. And that applies to companies, that applies to customers as well. So I think it's important that we get our act right on the manufacturing because what we talk is Growth with jobs, jobless growth doesn't help anybody. What US is getting is jobless growth. So I think manufacturing gives you a growth with the job. But what is happening, as I told you, because of the VUCA world we are living in, the, the context has changed. The traditional model of manufacturing has come under a huge pressure. First is the uberization of customer expectations. It has really spoiled our expectations. Today, you, when you want, you get a car. When you want, you go. So same thing is happening in the industrial business also. Customer wants choice, infinite choice. Customer wants no lead times. We used to work on planning of three months, six months. No, they wanted replenishment model. So the it has percolated our behaviors, our culture. So industry has to respond to it. We can't no longer have a long gestation time cycles. The Moore's law, which started with the semiconductor industry, is happening to every industry. I come from fashion industry. There used to be two design seasons: autumn, winter, spring, summer. There are 24 now. Zara has taught 24 seasons. People air freight garments now. So the whole thing is changing. And manufacturing can't be an island by itself. So if you stick to a traditional model, you will never make it. And the third, the fourth one is the fourth industrial revolution, the industry 4.0. After every industrial revolution, one great country has come. <coughs> when the steam engines came, after that the UK was the great economy. Assembly line came, America became a great economy. Digitization came, Japan became a great economy, China followed. I think this is a time when India or some country will lead, take leadership. So 
this is a time for us to grab the opportunity. This changed context is now being followed by a new paradigm. <clears throat> very, very difficult. Costs are rising, but prices to go down. You have seen on television, you have seen on computers, you have seen on semiconductors, everything, the prices are going down, but costs are going up. <clears throat> Date of obsolescence, half-life of every product has become much less, but you have to have make more innovation, you have to make more money innovation. The, the half-life half life of drugs used to be so big, used to have reserve for 15 years and then get the money for 15 years. But now it doesn't happen anymore. We all say you must fail to learn, but we also want right first time. So I am saying we have to manage paradoxes. So manufacturing has to now ma ma manage the paradoxes. And the customer loyalties are vanishing. But at the same time, we talk customer stickiness. So what I am saying is we have to look at manufacturing from a different lens altogether. Let's see against this backdrop what how is India doing. Today, the Indian manufacturing is about $400 billion economy. They forget about last couple of years, the whole world is going through a turmoil. We have grown about 7.3 respectable percentage. But today also, the India's GDP to manufacturing only 16%. We need minimum 20%. China is 29%. Germany is 20%. The eight sectors account for 60% of the growth of the manufacturing. And I think we have to focus on these 60% because we can't create a new sector overnight. And these sectors by themselves are 400 billion dollar sectors. So if I have to become a trillion dollar economy, we have to drive hard on these sectors. As for paucity of time, I won't go into the detail, but these are the eight sectors where we need to focus going forward. Now, if I was to grow at my historical pace, I would not reach, I would barely reach a 700 billion dollars. Your dream is one, one trillion dollar. So you have to add extra four to five percent growth rate into your manufacturing uh, progress. And that means you have to get about 300 to 400 billion dollar extra investment into manufacturing over the like next three to four years. How do we do that? There are four ways of doing it. I call them the four pillars to the strategy. One is focus on gaining larger share of exports. This is the fastest way to do it because you don't have to create demand. Creating demand is the biggest problem. So if you have to create demand, you can have long gestation time. But global markets are available to you. All you have to do is be competitive. Today, textile is $800 billion trade in the world. I have only 3% market share. If I can double it, you are talking about $150 billion adding to your bottom line. So the fastest way to grow is leverage your competencies. And to my mind, textile, pharma, and metals are three areas that you can really make a difference. Second, another one, import substitution. We import $29 billion worth of chemicals in this country. All you have to do is get your cost right, you get a quality world class and you get that market share. So I think first two categories are the ones we have to focus. If I have to do 80-20 in my strategy, category one, category two. Category three is strategy for the future. Is a horizon two, horizon three. But we need to be here. Again, not difficult, defense. I was talking to some defense guys. 90% of the defense is imported. The huge industry, but everything on imports. When Honorable Prime Minister talks about defense, there is a logic to it. If I can start making it here, you can add more than $100 billion to your bottom line. Health and Ayurveda, wellness is a big trend. We gave the world yoga and yoga has been taken away from us. Wellness is a big industry which I think India can really leverage in a, in a big way. Electric vehicles, we have missed the bus, but perhaps we can do a catch up. And the fourth is another very important category. If you look at the Indian manufacturing, the average capacity utilized is 75 to 80%. Industry 4.0 with the IoT, with the, uh, with the analytics, you can unlock 10 to 12% capacity growth through optimization and 4 to 5% through cost reduction. I think you can get 25% extra capacity without any major capital investment. So if I was doing a five-year horizon planning, two years growth I can get through leveraging industry 4.0. I think we are missing that link. We have to work hard. Get this right, so by the time your other investment comes on track, you have been able to get the growth you want. So I think it is very much doable. A trillion dollar is not a pipe dream. It's very much doable. If I look, if I put what I'm telling you into numbers, if, even if I grow pharma exports by double, it is only 3% of the world's global exports. Nothing. You are 3% in the la la large pie. If you, <clears throat> if you, uh, like if you have to talk about uh, Automobile, if you, if you triple, triple the exports, only 1.5% of the world export market. Textile, 
you go to 6%, you can add $200 billion into your turnover. All I am saying is, these are, when you look at the larger pie in the world, it is not that menacing. It's easily doable. But then the question is, why are we not able to do it? What is ailing us? So let's understand, let's look at what is ailing the Indian manufacturing. And why are we not able to achieve that global leadership? I think first, all of us know, are the factor costs. India has some inherent disadvantages. The power cost is one. I have seven rupees 50 paisa average power cost, the highest in the world. Logistics, 15% of the GDP is my logistics cost. China has 9%. There are, uh, financing costs are very high, so we know this, this part of it. Culture, I think we are forgetting that. The softer skills are more important than the, than the, uh, than the hard skills. The Japanese culture in manufacturing, very high cost economy. Germany even costs cost the economy, but still they are competitive. I think manufacturing needs the culture, culture of compliance. Culture, it's, it's like an army, it's like a military. You have to do what you're supposed to do. I'll give you a small example. I used to work for a global MNC. My own company in Japan, I used to export tea bags to them. And we agreed with them that we put a staple, it will be one millimeter from the top both sides. Typical Indian, we put a staple slightly cockeyed. It became 1.2 and 1. No problem. Tea bag was perfect. The guy rejected the whole lot. He said, you told me 1.1, it has 1. I will not take 1.2. I said, no, tea bag is good. No tea is coming out. You can be nothing doing. I think that's where they get perfection. We have to be 99.9 .9 doesn't work. In global market, it is 100%. Go, no, go. So the culture is very important when it comes to be a global leader. And third is trade packs. I'll share with you, I think it's a the world is getting more and more protect, protected. The world is talking more and more bilateral. It is no longer a multilateral world. So I think we must get really good uh, FTAs. Vietnam is a great example by, by, by how the country has grown through FTAs. So I would say, while seven and a half rupees looks a very high power cost, but I think there is a pathway through power sector reforms. If I can reduce the, the, uh, the, the aggregate transmission and consumption losses from by 12%, it is possible. In, in Delhi, I am told, Tata's have reduced from 55 to 10%. So if at and losses will reduce by 12%, if we optimize our, our purchase mix, buy more solar in the discoms, and if we remove cross subsidies, you can bring down to 4.9. Just imagine if all of you get power at 4.9, it changes the ball game. Logistics. We have not used, Mr. Gadkari was here today. Waterways, we have not used 3%, we use waterways. Make it 15%. Go up train rail by 10%. You will save $100 billion in logistics cost. So it's a doable. I think we have to get right plans, right strategies, and implement them. Textile. We keep cribbing about textile, Bangladesh, Vietnam. I did a study. 60% of my disadvantage is because I don't have an FTA with Europe, Europe and US, where Bangladesh gets 9.5% advantage. I signed the FTA it goes from $40 billion to $150 billion. So I think we must know where the shoe is pinching and do the right things, rather than doing every time do everything. We keep cribbing about a lot of things. What you can't help, don't crib about it. Same thing with electronics. China has cost of 7%. Why India can't give you protection? This is a very valid argument. Ask for it. FTAs. We had a FTA with ASEAN. In that period, Vietnam, everyone has grown. Our deficit has gone up from 7 billion to 21 billion. So we have lost at the cost of partner countries. I think we have to relook at these FTAs. Sign right FTAs. Sign FTA with EU. Sign FTA with UK. I think that's what you have to do that. So how can we create value through manufacturing? And these are the generic points, but I think it's very important. Ease of doing business, reducing cost of doing business, adoption of industry 4.0, Focus on upscaling, very important. I'll share German model with you. Policy environment and, as Mr. Gupta said, get more investment in manufacturing. But broadly, it boils down to three things. Learn, have the humility to learn from successful companies. Leverage disruption, rather than getting disrupted. This is a good time, 4.0 is coming, use it. And third, take high ground on emerging platform. Sustainability is a great platform. I think India can take an advantage and we can build a huge business on green chemistry and sustainability. 
So successful examples they have told about Vietnam, very classic case, 30 years back, a poor country. Today where it is, you can understand. All they have done is done the right things, right policies, reduced tariffs, and went, went for it. Germany. Germany is higher cost than, than US. But believe me, only 28% guys in Germany go to university. All of them do, they have a great apprenticeship scheme. After school, the kids go into this apprenticeship scheme where they work in the factory and study vocational training. And they make a big, big career. Some of them become the CEOs of Mercedes and BMW. I think because they respect technical people, they respect technicians, and that's what has to come out. So I think the German model is a great model for us to adopt in terms of skilling. <coughs> Policies, I think Max Planck Society, they have 83 industry sector where they do R&D. So to get a very focused R&D, into, into this, which, which gives you a benefit. Third and the biggest thing, somebody spoke about MSMEs. Entire growth of Germany is given by MSMEs. All innovations with Mercedes and BMW come out with are coming from the MSMEs. They call them Mythland. And these are the companies which innovate, which do new things and supply. 37% of the GDP comes from these companies. And I think you must follow their model. But MSMEs are the life and blood of any, any industry. Large industries draw upon the expertise and make them saleable to the larger world. And fourth, the policy part of it. Second, I think, uh, I, I will not talk much about it, but we must understand, the traditional manufacturing was scale-driven, low-cost production, mass customization. What we require in future, variety, individualization, flexibility, and that can come through digitization and industry 4.0. And I think that's what we have to leverage. These all tools, we are aware of about it. I will not spend time on this. But I'll give you just one small example how the whole equation is changing. We always spoke about low-cost countries, high-cost countries. Adidas has reversed the whole trend. They now say what they call speed factories. The small factories located close to market, which use 3D printing, so they don't have to go to uh, Indonesia to get their uh, thing made up there. It's all done through computerized modeling. The lead time has been brought down drastically. And these factories now, if you see <clears throat> earlier, the time to market was 18 months. Now, in less than a week, they keep making changes. And people pay you for variety. People pay you for changes. The number of employees is less. I think with this model, they have been able to overcome the high cost. There are times when Adidas and Zara used to air freight their goods from India to service the European market. They don't need to do anymore. All I'm saying is that there is a dynamic change happening between countries because of this new disruption. And we must make sure hey, we don't get disrupted, rather leverage it to disrupt somebody else. Third, and very important is the nascent areas. I told you, green chemistry, very important, logistics, aerospace and defense, urban infrastructure, Mr. Gupta also spoke about it. And I am not talking utopian things. We have island of excellences in this country itself. I come from a group which is the largest aluminum rolling company in the world. In this country, with this ecosystem, with these policies, I produce aluminum at the lowest cost. I produce viscose at the lowest cost. This is Tata Steel, which has the most competitive steel manufacturing. I have I'm a cement business, which is third largest in the world. All we need to do is horizontally replicate the islands of excellence across the country. I think it can be done as long as we put our minds together and have the ambition. Why China is successful? Because when they plan, they don't plan for today. They plan for 100 years later. We need to do that. Put capacity for future, not for today. So what is the recipe to stay ahead of the curve? Build global scale. But second is very important. Like we did not have a technology for aluminum rolling. So we acquired the company. Don't go from back to basics. It will take me 20 years to get that technology. Where you can't have, have, have technology, go and buy it. Acquire. I, I did a $10 billion acquisition in the U.S. Today I have got the biggest aluminum company and we have the technology. Second is cost curve, very important. Any investment, you should always locate yourself on the cost curve. Be on the top decile, if not top quartile. Value chain. We talk about cost always. No, it is triple A value chain. Agile, adaptive, aligned. I think cost is a given factor. So it, what happened in Fukushima disaster? The whole automobile industry suffered. You have to make sure any black swan event, how do you handle that? And that's the part of supply chain planning. 
I think I spoke enough about technology, and I think I'll talk think about employee skilling. Very important because it's people who make the difference. And I think ultimately we all must plan our businesses to be in a last man standing position. If the world comes to an end, you should be the last guy to be to die or kill. That's that's the kind of position. That's what our chairman says. And I, you may be wondering, is 2025 realistic? I'll just share with you this picture. This picture is New York in 1900. All horse carts, you can barely see one car. And New York in 1913, you cannot see any horse cart, only one horse cart, all cars. So 13 years, the world swung. So when you are on an S curve, the growth doesn't happen in linear, it happens in S curve. So if you're at the tipping point, the growth can happen very fast. And I believe we are at the S curve in manufacturing. India has the capability. Mobile. The AT&T got hired McKinsey to do a study in 1985. They say, in the best case, how many mobile I can sell for 20 years down the line? They said 900,000. What did they sell? 109 million. Now, that is the power of S curve. You must understand the S curve for the industry, S curve for your competition, S curve for your capability, and 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 S curve for your talent. It's not about S curve for finances, and that will help you find your disruption. So who will disrupt you next is what you have to find out beforehand. Otherwise, you, have, you uh, have a risk of extinction. So to sum up, I think if we, it is achievable goal, the three major legs of the strategy should be exports, import substitution, and build a strong domestic consumption base. Enablers are reduce cost of doing business, develop technological skills, get favorable trade policy impacts, and focus on job skilling and creation. I think India can do it. We know how to do it. We have the requisite capability. What we lack is the passion to win, the culture of world-class manufacturing, and an aligned stakeholders. If we can get that right, to me it is a very doable business. And finally, the people will make a difference. I, this statement is very important. The most important new development in business technology is not the technology per se, but the people leveraging the technology. I always say you can get a Ferrari, only Schumacher and Hamilton can win the race, you can't win the race. The hardware is just a neighbor. I think people make a difference. The soft skill makes a difference. So I'll end up with Michael Jordan's quote. Some people want it to happen, some wish it to happen, and others make it happen. I think we need this third group of people in India if we have to realize a trillion dollar dream and a five trillion dollar economy. Thank you so much. I think I'm just in time. <laughs>